Okay. So today's presentation is following the release of um, ISO 45003, uh, Psychological Health and Safety at Work, Managing Psychological Risks. We have got the great pleasure to welcome Joanne Chambers of Latham Capability, with the help of our very own Elsa Mason of Inspire Safety, who are going to outline the work they are collaborating on to support businesses in implementing the standard. Okay, so I'm hoping it's new, it's new for me this, and it'll probably be new for most of you guys. So I'll take it, I hope we all get something out of it, which I'm sure we will. Um, and I'll hand over to Joanne now to start us off, and then we'll finish the quarter past this, Joanne. Yeah, for a question and answer session. So put your questions in the chat for me to call it. Okay. I'm going on mute and I'll hand over to John. Thank you. Hi, morning. Oh, it's afternoon. Now, afternoon, everybody. Let me just share my slides. Can everybody they come through, Elsa? Yeah. Okay. Um so thank you for the introduction and, and for having me along today alongside Elsa. Just to introduce myself, um, as I said, my name is Joanne Chambers. I am an occupational psychologist. I set up um, Lakeland Capabilities about 10 years ago now um, and have probably spent the last five of that sort of heavily focusing my work on mental health at work and sort of well-being in, in the workplace. Um, and through that kind of work, I've, I've sort of made connections with Elsa um, and, and then we've sort of come together to, to collaborate on the work we're doing at the moment. Um, so, so I think for those of you who don't know about ISO 45003, um, we will go through that a little bit of detail today. Um, it, it brings together two fields, really. It's, it's the sort of health and safety background, but it's really got that, that background of psychology in there as well and that, that focus on people. So, so that's kind of the, the benefit of me and Elsa coming to, to work together on that is it's, it's covering off those different angles, um, which is really, really important when we're looking at psychosocial risk, which we're going to go through today. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about ISO 45003 which was released in um, June this year. But really to give this some context into how it can be applied in businesses and some of the business issues that it might help address. So we're gonna go through some of those first and then get into the nitty gritty of, of the standard itself, okay. So as Gary said, any questions, put them in the chat and hopefully we'll have the opportunity to go through those at the end. Okay, so. So on the first slide here, um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the issues that many businesses are facing at the moment with high turnover. You'll have seen it in the news and, and social media a lot, the great resignation. And, and there's a lot of data and research coming out at the moment, sort of statistics everywhere suggesting that there's a mass exodus of employees from their jobs. A lot of people handing their notice in. Um, and, and really, we are still in the throes of a global pandemic, so it's quite an unusual shift, given what we've sort of the uncertainty we've we've gone through in the past um, sort of eighteen to twenty months. And um, the current retention and talent shortage issues that that we've faced, sort of ongoing for years in Cumbria, um, are worsening really due to the changes in work design that were brought about by the pandemic. So we've got we've got issues. We've always had issues in the area um, with, with a with a sort of small talent pool. But but what we've got going on now, we've got this kind of escalating competition for workers, further sort of shrinking of the talent pool, and it's coming together, and it's really intensifying a very sort of employee in control marketplace. And as you can see from the slide, you know, there's data here. Microsoft have done. Um, a survey of over 30,000 global workers and 41% considering quitting or changing um, professions this year, which is high, high number. So there's a typo there, it says progressions, it should say professions. Um, and, and the cost of this turnover to businesses is, is, is huge. Um, and the predicted cost is supposed to be sort of coming up 17 billion um, in the next 12 months. 
Um, and, and obviously that, that might not come to fruition, um, but if these projections do ring true, then, then these turnover costs to the UK are going to be very problematic. But it's not just the cost that, that cause issues, it's the time and talent cost to our businesses along the way. So we need to do what we can to improve retention and attract talent to our organisations. And one area where there is a really, really strong need for focus is in the area of workplace stress and mental health. Um, and if you look at this study on the graph, it um, is a recent study carried out um, looking at employees and HR decision makers when considering reasons that people give for resignations. And it really highlights the disconnect between employees and employers' perceptions on, on why people are leaving jobs. So, so you can see from the graph that, that the study shows that sort of combining the toxic workplace culture and, and work-life balance, we've got over 44% of respondents who were planning to quit their job, wanted to do so because of these factors, because of a work-life balance, because of, of a toxic workplace culture. Um, but there's quite a worrying disconnect between HR managers recognising these as factors. And they're really, really underestimating the pushing power of a toxic workplace culture, but sort of overestimating the, you know, the pull power of factors such as, as pay and benefits. And, and it's really crucial that we look at this as we start to sort of consider psychological health and safety and, and how much of a factor it might actually be playing in this sort of high turnover resignation issue that, that, that we've got going on at the moment. OK, so I'll just take you on to the next slide. And, and I think in, in considering psychosocial risk, um, we really, really need to look at what employees value. And, and I think this has changed, not just because of the pandemic. I think it was changing anyway. Um, so this research suggests that, that what employees value in, in their jobs has, has changed. Um, and, and it's playing a huge part in, in making people think what they want from their jobs. So recent research, pre-pandemic research, 52% of employees would choose a company that cared about their well-being over a company that pays 10% more. So quite a clear drive for that want to have your well-being looked after at work. And then we've got 86% of millennials would take a pay cut to work for a company whose mission aligns with their own. And, and that's 2017 research. And, and, and we get this trend with millennials um, where they're far more interested in, in having their sort of values lined up. But, but when we start to consider that the oldest millennials are, are turning 40 now, that's a, a really large portion of the workforce that, that we're looking at. Um, so uh, among the six workplace factors examined as part of that glass store research, compensation and benefits were consistently rated amongst the least important uh, factors in, in workplace happiness. So it's the culture and values of an organisation that people are interested in, followed closely by the quality of senior leadership and career opportunities at the company that are of greater importance. So it's less and less about money and pay. And looking at that third bullet point, um, more than half employees surveyed from around the world, and this is really recent research, this is Ernst & Young this year, would consider, consider leaving their jobs post-COVID if they don't get the kind of flexibility that they're looking for um, in terms of where and when they work. So really suggesting that obviously the pandemic has given people a lot more freedom um, to choose these aspects of how they work, where they work, when they work, and people don't want to let that go. And that's very much um, sort of influencing whether people pick different roles. I think you'll all know from, from sort of your own organisations that the pandemic has really accelerated the demand for change in, in terms of what employees value, um, particularly those who were sent home to work from home. You know, it's never happened before. And, and we've got situations of employees being exposed to a very different working environment and, and, it, and it changing their perception. 
people want to work for organisations where the values align with their own. And they've got a far greater wish list, I think, now in relation to terms and conditions uh, following the pandemic. And they're willing to vote with their feet when it comes to, to return to work policies and the terms and conditions of their contract. So, so the message is very, very clear that the employees have a far stronger idea of what they want and what they value, and they'll happily leave a, a role to ensure that they get it. So, so how does this relate to mental health? Well, what we are seeing and we have been seeing for many years are quite worrying figures in relation to, to workplace well-being and, and mental health. Um, and recent research from, from Deloitte, this is from this year, would suggest that, that it, it only focused, the report was just on millennials and Z, uh, Generation Zs. Sort of coming up half of them feeling stressed or anxious most or all of the time, and, and almost half again reporting feeling more stressed since the start of the pandemic, which is not surprising, I mean, given what we've all gone through. Um, but, but more interestingly and more concerningly is kind of coming up half again who have taken time off for work, uh, taken time off work for mental health reasons, have given their employer a different reason for this absence. So again, we're getting this really quite clear disconnect between what businesses know about what's going wrong in their organisations versus what the employees' perceptions are. Um, and looking at the graph, this is HSE data running up until March 2020. So this doesn't include any kind of sort of impact of, of the pandemic. Um, and the rise in work related stress, anxiety and depression sort of, you know, there's that the obvious upkick in, in, in the line there. Um, for to the 2019-2020 data. So there's a really quite obvious rise in the figures in relation to work-related stress. And that's obvious, I mean, the, the figures for the, the pandemic, so all of 2020 plus the first quarter of 2021 will come out sort of November time this year. So it'd be really interesting to see where that graph line has gone. Um, up, I think is, is what we're all expecting. Um, so, so the situation was fairly worrying as we went into the pandemic. Um, and so we're faced with a twofold problem, really. We, we've got the issue that our organisations are facing in relation to staff retention and the mobility of our workforce and the opportunities that are now available to people. Secondly, we've got this um, these issues relating to stress, depression and anxiety of our workforce. 17.9 million days of work lost due to, um, so this will be absenteeism data, due to stress, anxiety and depression in 2019, 2020. That's the highest number ever on record. So, so we are looking at worrying figures um, in, and, and, and thinking of the available pool of personnel we have to, you know, to our organisations, we, we've got this combined problem going on here. Okay, so, What causes some of this mental health? Um, and this graph here is, um, it's fairly old data. It's 2013, 2015 data, but it shows a clear trend um, where factors intrinsic to the job tend to account for a very large portion of, of workplace mental ill health. And this is data reported by GPs. So this isn't coming from organisations. This is when individuals go to the GP and, and, and talk about um, mental health. And, and this is the reasons given. So it's clearly showing that, you know, nearly half of cases, work itself is actually the problem. And when you look at the combination of other factors, traumatic events account for a tiny proportion of, of mental ill health. Um, with, with a really quite significant amount um, being caused by factors associated with, with people's job. Um, so, so it is the main cause of work-related stress, depression or anxiety. And, and workload is often the one that, that is coming up top. Tight deadlines, too much work, too much pressure, too much responsibility. Um, 
the last 12 to 18 months will have caused further issues for employees thinking of sort of what we all endured whatever your circumstances were during the pandemic um we had people working around children off sick people working from home environments that really might not have been suitable people losing the connection to to you know the people that they usually work with and all of this has sort of amalgamated into to an increase in working hours and, and the data suggests that working hours increased by 12.5 hours over the last year which is a really really substantial um, <coughs> increase in the number of hours and, and whether that's down to people working less efficiently because of what was going on um, and, and struggling to sort of work in an efficient manner but it but it's people's lives that you know these hours are taking up people's home lives um, and looking at you know what causes the mental health at work 57 percent of mental ill health at work is caused by excessive work demands for those working from home compared to 46 percent of those attending a workplace a normal amount so that would suggest that the people who were sort of dispersed to their home offices during the pandemic suffered more um, than those and, and and again maybe not surprising in terms of what they were perhaps having to deal with and, and the changes and that kind of thing um, so, so the data tells us that, that it, it is work that's causing these problems um, it, for us so a fairly sort of depressing set of statistics to start us off so what I want to take you through now is, is some of the more positive um, data that we've got out there um, and this graph here, it's kind of complex and there's a lot of bars on it, so apologies for the amount of data, but it, it shows some really, really positive trends um, in the area of well-being. So this is CIPD report that has been done across four years um, from 2018 through to 2021. Um, and, it's, and it's showing some really positive trends um, in how organisations are dealing with, with well-being and, and mental health issues. And as somebody who's worked in this field for, for sort of more years than this, I would, I would definitely say, you know, you, when I started out working in this area, some organisations were literally doing nothing. Um, that, that tends to be quite rare now and, and organisations are definitely improving. Um, so, so employee well-being is continuing to rise up the corporate agenda and um, and this graph shows that sort of year on year organizations are improving in terms of the activities they're carrying out um, and, and some really noticeable changes there you know a really encouraging fall in the proportion who report that that organization is much more reactive than than proactive so it's so the suggestion that organizations are beginning to to plan for for well-being issues and and beginning to become sort of more structured in their approach a bit of a smaller increase in in the proportion that have got a formal well-being strategy but still that's now half of businesses having a standalone well-being strategy um set in their organization which is is, is amazing really compared compared to sort of you know 10 years ago they were unheard of sort of thing um three quarters of respondents believing that senior leaders have employee well-being on their gender and that's a noticeable jump up and i'm going to talk a little bit about um leaders in a minute but but having senior leaders in an organization on board with this is is absolutely crucial so that's a real sort of positive of jump and then the final one on the check that, you know, two, thought, two thirds report that line managers are bought into the importance of well-being. Again, quite a noticeable jump up from last year. <clears throat> so we're seeing that organisations are starting to look at well-being as something that they have to do rather than waiting for incidences to arise from individuals and I think there's, there's trends in there here to suggest that their offering is more across the whole organization rather than just sort of re responding to the individuals that, that pre present. I know from my own work that you know the demand for my services rocketed during the latter half of 2020 um organizations that i've never engaged with before wanting to put something out there for staff i would say a lot of it was very one-off um, and it hasn't continued 
so there is still you know an ad hoc nature to, to what organizations do but still positive to suggest that, that, that there has been quite an increase in um <coughs> sorry i'm coughing increase in, in how um how much attention businesses are placing on well-being and and looking now a little bit in terms of um the return on investment so we're generally seeing rising levels of mental ill health. And unfortunately, I think this is a trend that's going to be quite long lasting um, with the, the pandemic, particularly among younger and more disadvantaged employee groups. So it's certainly not something we're expecting to, to go away in the coming years. And one really key factor in success in terms of managing well-being in the workforce appears to be whether the organisation responds to the issues on an ad hoc basis or has a formal strategy in place. So looking at the um, figures in, in relation to return on investment, they range between £40 per pound invested and £10.80 per pound invested, with an average now of £5.20 uh, £5 uh, per pound invested. This has actually gone up um, it was last measured by Deloitte in, in 2017 and it was £4.20 then. So it's gone up a reasonable amount, which would suggest we're getting better at bringing in the right intervention and potentially at the right time. Um, we're, you know, we're getting far more uh, reward coming back off these investments. Um, what the, the data tells us is that organisations with a standalone wellbeing strategy are much more likely to take a holistic approach compared to, to those that don't. Um, and that's why you tend to get the, the better return on investment. And the largest returns focus on, on that really early stage uh, support, screening individuals so they can produce, um, provide much more targeted support. And the kind of support that gets the best return is, is, is this early stage support that um, prevents mental conditions from worsening. It keeps people at work, basically. Um, <clears throat> and, and the sort of universal and, and small group training um, is proving really beneficial. But what it's really important to, you know, to consider is that you can't treat everybody with a group session and it wouldn't be right to do so. You know, the group sessions are really, really effective for early stage support for people not necessarily with diagnosed mental health conditions. But, but people needing one-on-one -on -one therapy will need one-on-one -on -one therapy and, and shouldn't be sort of shoved in a, in a group session of mindfulness and expected to, to find that useful. So, so we need to have that range of interventions on offer. Um, but it's just about organisations trying to recognise when to bring stuff in and, and, and when it's most appropriate. And I think what we also need to consider is that, that not everybody will ever need one-on-one -on -one um, mental health support um, and not everyone will end up in a position where the difficulties they face um, result in, in a diagnosed condition. Um, and, and much of what employees are experiencing is a reaction to, to psychosocial risk, which I'm, I'm going to talk about today, that can be addressed at a group level before it reaches, um, uh, you know, that, that more targeted individual level. And I think as businesses, we do tend to shy away from dealing with issues because we think everything's clinical in nature. Um, and if we reframe our thinking to consider psychosocial hazards that exist in workplaces that we can measure and we can mitigate, then we can start to build a much more systemic approach to, to dealing with psychological health and safety. And that is very much the, the aim of, of the new ISO standard. And, and one way I think a, a really good way to think about it is, is when you think of a fish tank. Um, so those of you who, who've had fish tanks, my daughter's uh, got a fish tank with four little fish in, three as of this week actually. Um, and, and they're quite delicate little things, aren't they, little goldfish? And, and when we deal with issues with our fish tanks, we primarily assume when we get a sick fish that there's something wrong with the fish tank. Um, and overfeeding is often a problem in our house. Um, cleaning the water, cleaning the filter, taking the fish out, cleaning the whole tank, all those kind of things. But very rarely do we look at an individual fish and think, 
gosh, what's wrong with you? I'll put you in a different tank on your own. Wait till you get better and plonk you back in the fish tank. Um, but actually, that is what we tend to do in our organisations. We, we send someone off on sick, bring them back to the same potentially toxic environment that, that they went off sick from and, and hope in the meantime they've kind of developed the ability to cope better with their difficulties. And, and it's, it's the approach that kind of organisations have culturally adapted, you know, quite a reactive approach, but it, but it does seem to be the way we sort of historically have dealt with mental health at work. And we need to become far more, um, consider that sort of fish tank approach where we actually look at the environment we're placing people in and asking ourselves, is there something toxic about that environment that, that is going to be causing problems for employees, particularly where you've got organisations where you've got a number of people presenting with stress and mental health issues um, that would suggest it's more than the individual sort of at play there. OK. And another huge factor in in building up to looking at this psychosocial risk is, is the impact of line management on well-being. And it's really, really important when we look at any interventions that we bring into organisations that we consider the impact that a line manager can have. Because um, as an organisation, you can provide a whole host of resources to employees. But technically, they could all fall flat if the employee has a very toxic relationship with their line manager, who could essentially be the source of the stress. So line managers are thought to have around four times the impact of any well-being intervention. And the most, they're the most critical aspects of su supporting employee mental health. You know, the, if you go and speak, you can go and speak to all the mental health first aid trainers you can, but potentially it's not going to have any benefit if, you, if you're overworked, you're micromanaged by your boss, um, or you've got a boss that just doesn't know how to, to deal with the issues that you're presented with. And the Farmer Stevenson report that, that was issued in 2017, um, for those of you who don't know, is a big government commissioned um, report, pretty much said that, you know, employers want to do the right thing, but line managers pretty much lack the training or the confidence required to effectively support others at, at a basic level. And, and actually some IOSH data that, that, that came out um, from 2019 suggests 62% of line managers are not receiving enough help from their organisations to support their mental, uh, the mental wellbeing of their staff. And only 31% said they feel they've been sufficiently trained to recognise signs of poor mental health. So it's, it's a major problem, is that few managers know what to do or say when someone discloses a mental health issue. Um, and, you know, chances are if you've got a back problem, your manager would have a clearly defined care pathway for you um, with a physical assessment, recommended adjustments, support and that sort of thing. And, and we need to get to that point where that is commonplace um, for mental health issues as well. So moving on now to the actual guidelines itself. So I sort of don't know how much people know about the ISO, um, the 45,003 five guidelines. Um, it was released in June this year, as I said, and you know all the evidence I've gone through today really points to a real need to formalise our organisation's approach towards wellbeing. Firstly, in terms of a duty of care to our employees, but secondly, to address some of the retention and absenteeism issues that we're facing. So this, this has been a long time coming, this guidance, but, but actually released sort of in the midst of the pandemic. Um, it, it was an interesting time because, because so many of the issues that the, the guidance is looking to address have got so much worse because of the pandemic. So it, it couldn't have come at a better time, really. Um, and, and the aim of this guidance is, is recognising that employers have a responsibility to protect both the physical and the psychological health of their staff. And it's a, it's a global standard. So it's the world's first international standard that um, looks at psychological health and safety. For those of you who want to know more about the standard itself, um, we can deal with that in the questions. It, it, I know we can sort of share the link of how to, to get hold of it. It's currently free of charge for small businesses, um, usual threshold of um, 25 million turnover or under 250 staff. So it is actually free to get hold of for small businesses. So it links to 45001. 
um, which is its parent standard, the Occupational Health and Safety Standard, which, which I think most of you will, will be familiar with. Um, it's undergone an extensive consultation and review process involving 70 countries. Um, I know HSE were heavily involved, the British Psychological Society um, were involved in, in, in bringing this um, guideline through. And it is a much more systematic approach to managing psychosocial risk. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what psychosocial risk is in a minute, um, in a few slides. Um, and this formal, um, I think many organisations have been relying on wellbeing programmes to address psychosocial risk at work, but the evidence really suggests that this approach is not reducing the overall burden of psychosocial impacts at work. And we need a formal management system approach, which will provide a robust framework within, within which an organisation can take that, that much more systematic approach to managing the risk. So, so the standards address many areas that can impact a worker's psychological health and safety, including ineffective communication, excessive work pressure, poor leadership, organisational culture, all those kind of things. Um, and, it, and it's got a similar structure to, to the 45001 um, standard and, uh, you know, requiring commitment from leadership, that very sort of robust identification and management of, of hazards and risks process. Um, lots of planning and resources involved and, and performance evaluation and then clear, clear sort of guidance on where organisations need to improve. So that, that sort of risk assessment cycle that you will be really familiar with, but applying it to, to psychosocial risk. Um, so, so what is psychosocial risk? Is it that, that's the phrase that kind of gets mentioned loads throughout all the, the 45003 um, paperwork. And, and it refers to those intangible hazards in a workplace that, that have the potential to cause mental, emotion or, or mental, emotional or psychological harm. And I think it's the intangible part of this that, that causes problems um, in terms of much harder to measure. And, and, and perhaps why we haven't paid so much attention to it in the past. And, and I think, you know, thinking about the pandemic and the impact it has, it's really accelerated the demand for change and, and creating opportunities to, to make work better. But I think we need to consider, and, and the data in the slides I've shown you all already suggest that, you know, if work is part of the issue, um, when it comes to workplace stress and, and mental health, and all the all the evidence suggests that it is, then then good job design has to be part of the solution. And it's going back to you know to that fish tank. So we need to use work design to improve well-being, but also to to increase attraction to organisations to reduce turnover. Organisations will increasingly want to know what an organisation's well-being strategy is before taking a job. Okay. So that's the guidance itself. Moving on to how we can apply it. So, so I don't know if people are, are familiar with this. This is the uh, mental health continuum. And we all exist somewhere on these two different axes and, and can move around them. And the idea of the two axes is to highlight that we can have people with diagnosable mental illness who cope well and experience positive well-being. So they would be in this sort of top left blue quadrant. Equally, we can have people with poor well-being who don't actually have a diagnosis of anything, and they would be in the, this sort of bottom, languishing, golden-coloured zone, although it doesn't probably feel very golden. Um, and we can all move around these different quadrants. And, and as a nation, we will have depleted levels of well-being following the pandemic, so a real downward shift in, in, in people's well-being. We've seen it in the far higher rates of, of prescription drugs for those who are sort of in the healthcare system. For those not diagnosed, it, you know, the picture's a lot less clear, but we are beginning to see coming through this sort of heavily predicted burnout and stress-related absenteeism. So when we consider the management of psychological health and safety, we need to be thinking where people are on this continuum. Um, in terms of how we manage um, anything that, that, that we introduced. Um, and that's the real benefit of the, the ISO 45003 approach, is, is it encourages organisations to consider the actual risk factors outside of the individual themselves that might be causing the problem. 
and then helps to sort of think of an intervention then that, that's going to sort of be the most appropriate. So in terms of the psychosocial hazards that are covered by the standard, they're grouped into three main areas. So we've got how work is organised, social factors at work and, and the work environment. And if you look at this list, um, these psychosocial hazards correspond directly with the reasons people give for being stressed at work. They also match up pretty much identically with reasons employees give for leaving jobs. So this tells us a lot of the problems we're facing is down to psychosocial risk. And all of these factors would have been massively changed last March when, when our workplaces were disrupted, when the pandemic kind of came down, where employees would have been uh, sort of exposed to a huge list of these psychosocial factors when they were sort of expected to, to, to go home and work from home. And, and it, was, it was unavoidable at the time. It, you know, there wasn't the time to manage this properly. But what we are facing now is organisations kind of in that position where they are able to look with a bit more time to create hybrid work environments for, for their employees. So it's really important that in doing that, we consider the items on this list, these psychosocial hazards and, and the impact they're going to have on the employees of, of changes to their work design. OK, and if you look at this list, you can see how line managers can affect so many of the risk factors. So it's really crucial that we consider the impact of, of line managers. Um, as with many aspects of the, the pandemic, we, we're faced with a huge opportunity at the moment. Those organisations that really look into this and put, put their people first in terms of the, the sort of job redesign that is going on and the workplace redesign are going to definitely sort of come out of the pandemic thriving in relation to, the, to those that don't. So how does it work in, in sort of reality? Well, this is the risk assessment process, something that will be really familiar for those of you sort of used to working with health and safety standards. Um, <clears throat> The risk assessment needs to have controls that protect the many first before considering residual risk for, for individuals. And, and that's the aim of, of the standard. So as well as reflecting good risk management, this also links with the research where the return on investment is much, much higher from organisational company wide initiatives, like I was discussing earlier. And where the risk assessment process can differ for psychosocial risk is that the risk taking needs to be placed much more on employees lived experience of the business, not the management's estimate of what the risk is for employees um, or indeed anyone else, you know, doing the assessment remotely. So we, we need to ask people, what are the risks? Um, and we've already looked at some of the differences between the views of management employees in relation to this. So it's a fairly standard risk assessment process that involves identifying the hazards, assessing the risk to determine what changes can be made, mitigating and controlling those risks, and then reviewing those control measures. And, and, and background again, you know, that kind of continual risk assessment process. So one of the um, sort of products that, that Elsa and I have developed to, to really fit alongside the ISO 45003 uh, guidance is a risk assessment survey called PsychSafe. Um, and obviously any return on investment for an organisation is going to be linked to providing an intervention that targets the problem rather than just adopting a more generic approach. And that's the aim of the survey. So it would be carried out independently and anonymously, which is likely to, to increase um, trust and response rate. Um, and it will identify what it is about your business that could be causing issues for employees. So we've built, built a modular risk assessment survey, knowing the issues that people have in terms of completing surveys, you've got the option um, to pick and choose the modules that are relevant to your business. And it covers the full range of psychosocial risks outlined in the 45003 guidance. Also assesses organisational culture in relation to psychological health and safety. And what we've done with the results is we're feeding them back linked to the mental health continuum. So that the interventions are targeted to the organisational issues arising in, you know, in your own business. The aim of the survey is to identify the specific risks that might be present in an organisation, 
um, and move away from the sort of common current method that we have, which is basically teaching people to cope better with their own personal stress levels. So it's taking responsibility for the fact that we might be expecting employees to work in toxic work environments and, and what we can do about that. So here is a screenshot of just a small aspect of the survey. So it's called PsychSafe. And on the left here, we've got some of the modules that have been built into that. Um, also thought it was really important to include diversity and inclusion because sitting alongside mental health um, are a similar issues. People with diversity, um, particularly neurodiverse needs in the workplace, sort of encountering psychosocial risk factors in, in potentially a different way. Okay, so here's the mental health continuum in terms of, of how the data comes back. Um, so we have, what we would be doing was de designing the interventions that we recommend for organisations based on where the employees fall within the, um, we, we, which quadrant employees uh, fall within. And this helps us to consider interventions that are primarily, primarily aimed at individuals and those that are more organisational as well, because there will be some interventions that need to be targeted for individuals. Um, but as we discussed at the beginning, there's a much higher return on investment for the organisational interven intervention. So it's about sort of getting that mix and match for, for what sort of presents in your organisation. The aim is not to end up with an organization where every employee lands in the flourishing zone. There, is, there will always be mental health in organizations, but the aim is to target the poor well-being earlier and target those sort of issues that might be arising because of psychosocial risk factors within the organization. Um, and, and that early stage support as well. So, so we're using the mental health continuum to really sort of give organisations something that will be more useful to deal with and, and move away from that generic approach. So in terms of the survey itself, um, you know, it's looking at how your organisation measures up against psychosocial risk factors. Um, and, and getting on, how else do you get an honest response from your team in, in sort of sensitive areas? And, and I think a confidential sort of external survey is a good way to go about it. So we've currently got a range of organisations piloting this psych safe survey for us. Um, and we are providing them with complimentary report detailing the findings um, uh, that map to the mental health continuum. If anybody's interested in knowing more about this survey, um, we can talk you know contact us or, or we can chat it over um in the in the, the q a okay and then elsa i'm just going to hand over to you are you okay for finishing off super and and so the important bit having having got to the stage that you've got some kind of survey and some kind of information on what the situation is for your particular organization is that how you then build that into a, a strategy of, of interventions that will will move identify use the risks to your people um, so the interventions can be clearly scoped to target the employees in the relevant quadrants and identifying the aim of each inter intervention and the change that's anticipated from it so the idea being that this will help with capturing and demonstrating the learning that is gained for the different interventions it's about bringing structure and rigour to the wellbeing interventions and, and how we look at structuring those, monitoring, measuring and reviewing those so that we can map the change over time and demonstrate the benefits both to the organisation and to its people. Um, and we can use these, these principles of, uh, of this structure and rigour with or without the actual um, accreditation uh, for it or certification as they're calling it because it's it's not a compulsory part of the standard so we can use it standalone or we can um, you know apply its principles or we can we can go more formally if we're already uh, down the 45,001 route but it's all about bringing this rigour and structure to our intervention so that we can demonstrate the improvement that is being made through what we do. And I think with that, we're probably ready to move to questions. 
Okay, thanks very much, guys. Um, I've got a few questions to get through. So I've got them in a Word document, and I'm going to go through them just in the order that they came up within the uh, in the chat room. So the first question is from Carol Riley, and he's and it is: Do we HR professionals not appear to recognise a toxic work culture because they have had to use another reason for employees leaving due to how they have left, i.e., taking a um, a I don't know what that means taking a pay cut maybe to go due to a poor culture or pay off taking a pay off to go due to poor cultures etc. If that makes sense. So um, trying to answer the question there. So in terms of this is this mismatch I'm guessing between. Um, HR professionals sort of not necessarily knowing the reasons. I think there's a number of reasons why they don't. Um, I think employees are not necessarily always willing to say, and I think there are issues in terms of that. Um, systems in place in organisations that prevent them getting to the bottom of the reason as well. So, so yeah, I think, I think there are issues there, um, if that's what the question's getting at. Um, Elsa, have you anything you want to add to that? No, I, I think... Um... Yeah, I, I think it's a, a complex, complex matter, but I do think a lot of it is that is is about if people, whether or not people take the time and trouble to to have that that honest conversation um, when it's sometimes easier not to. Yeah, thanks for that. Okay, the second question is from Rob Wiley, and it states: Are the increased working hours due to working at home, i.e., not leaving work at work? I think, yeah, I think that's definitely, um, it's referring to those people who are working from home. And, and yeah, and I think some of it will be down to, as I said, sort of it, it was less efficient, wasn't it? In, in terms of managing to meet up with people. I think definitely at early days, we worked slower. Um, but, but yeah, I think it's, there's less boundaries in place um, when you work from home and that ability to just pop back in the evening is, is, is easier. And, and I think that is it. And it's how... Do, if we're going to make that decision in the future that we allow people that flexibility to work from home, how do we then consider that that risk factor of them them increasing their work hours? I, I certainly did um, and, and found it, you know, you've got to be very, very strict with your boundaries. So yeah, I think it, that probably is the reason for the rise. I suspect it's a lot less to do with those employees who carried on working in a similar type structure to, to what they did before the pandemic. I think there's also something there with um, with with how we set the the culture within particular teams and organisations, um, in that if you've got more senior members of uh, of the business who continue to email and continue to send things um, after what we might call normal working hours, then actually if people are picking those up. There's more of a pressure to respond uh, and to be seen to be to be working, and and I think it's really important that we that we address that within our organisations. Okay, thank you. The next question, um, it comes from Audrey Fleming, but there's a, there's a backup question from Shirley Fancy. And the first question from Audrey is, what are the elements of these strategies as many are EAP and health promos uh, than workplace provision, but also appears to be confliction whether this is the responsibility of HR, HSC, or occupational health. And then Shirley added on to that, at Audrey, I agree with your comment regarding organisational responsibility. And then it goes on to say, Joanne, what does the research find in terms of where it is best placed for optimum effect? So whose responsibility and where should it be best placed for optimum effect? I think the responsibility one is, is an ongoing problem and, and that is sometimes why wellbeing has been shelved a little bit because there is this issue, is it occupational health, is it health and safety, is it HR and, and it sometimes drops in between as it gets pushed around and, and I think the aim of the, the new ISO standard is to make it a far more across the organisational responsibility and, and bringing all the, it's everybody's responsibility. Um, if there's a formal well-being strategy in place it's a lot clearer whose responsibility is I, I think organizations that don't have that in place in the moment it, it is easy to fall between the cracks as it gets sort of pushed around a little bit so so I think 
there is a conflict there and, and the eight, that's one of the things that the standard is definitely looking to address to try and make it much more sort of across the organisation. Um, in terms of what does the research find in terms of when's the, the best place to optimum effect? The research shows that, that the early stage support is better, but that what you will have in organisations and what we have always had in organisations are individuals with complex needs that will not gain much benefit from sitting in a, you know, a, a sort of a generic stress reduction kind of intervention. So you, it's about tailoring it to, to, to who you've got and, but knowing what you've got. So, so there will be individuals who will need their workplaces redesigning. They'll need an ongoing sort of care pathway in place for them. And, and they may sort of drop in and out of work with absenteeism anyway, regardless of the psychosocial risk factors, because they might have their own complex needs. So I think for those individuals, it is looking at those issues on a one on one level. For those who have, you know, the people who were sat in that sort of languishing zone on the mental health continuum, they're not necessarily diagnosed with difficulties. It's not reached that point, but they're suffering poor well-being. Then I think it's that early stage group is, is, you know, those sort of group sessions are more effective in those situations. So whatever, it's early stage. Um, but but I, I think you you cannot eliminate mental health by thinking you go in early. You know, there will always be some people who carry on and have got complex needs. And it's about managing them to keep them in work as, as best they can. Um, but I think what's happened and sort of a lot of organisation responses sort of kicking all this off was to only deal with the people who presented with complex needs and and sort of those of us in the languishing zone often got left um, I think organizations have really improved in that area but I think the problem is we've got a lot of people sat in those languishing zone now because you know issues with the pandemic does that fully answer there was a few different yeah there was double prone but I think yeah you got there you're a good answer thanks very much for that um, David Deer wants to know, how do we stop this becoming just another certificate on the wall or just another way for certification bodies to make money? It's not a certification process in the same way as in you do not have to become accredited, it's guidance. Um, and in, in terms of making money, actually, they're giving it away free. Um, so, so at the moment, it's not particularly a money making exercise. Um, but in terms of, yeah, how, how do we do that? And I think it's, it's that, that's the cultural change, isn't it? Um, in terms of actually making this the, a conversation that sits at board level on a regular basis. Um, I think the standard goes a long way into, I think from my experience of working with businesses, um, they've got the good intention. They want to approach these issues they don't know how they don't know how to do it in a formalized way and I think the standard helps with that um, because looking at it from a risk assessment process is a really structured way to go about it um, so I think if you start to sort of adopt that organizational responsibility approach rather than looking at individuals and saying oh well you've got poor mental health if we start looking at our workplaces as potentially toxic environments I think that cultural change itself will help um, in, in terms of that again yeah is it is it a badge to get on the wall you would hope by going through the process and, and consulting people um, and getting their experiences and making changes on the back of that 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 sort of change would speak for itself Okay, thanks, Joanne. There's just two more short questions now. Victor Pastelero wants to know, I know you talked before about it being free to small businesses. Um, can individuals get it? I think that is, is the answer because he's put, where can we get a copy of the standard? Um, I can share now. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, my business is just me and I, I got a copy. So I will just bring it up and I'll see if I can share where you can get it from. Um, just bear with me a sec. It's the BSI shop. If I put a link in. Yeah. If I drop a link into the chat and um, that should hopefully work. That's quite a long link. 
Um, so that's the link to the shop that sells it. But but if you can prove, if you're a small business, it, it's free for a limited time. I don't I don't know how off, how much. I mean, I I sent over my details and straight away just sort of got issued with it as a as a free standard. So so that's the link for, for getting hold of it. And I take it if an individual's an employee, they'll have to sign up through their organisation. If they're a small com if they're if the large yeah. organisation will have to pay for it, basically, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think, yeah. I haven't I haven't tested that out because my organisation is very small, so um, yeah. you can be the same well, sir. Um, <laughs> yes, I'm not sure it's rigged up for an individual with an employee to get hold of a copy. Okay. Um, oh, there we go. Um, so it's a free as a download as a PDF. Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah. And the final question is, again, from Audrey Fleming. When we talk about the survey at the end there, is the survey valid and reliable, is the question. So we're in the midst of a validation process. So it, we aim for it to be, yes. Um, definitely, we're piloting at the moment. So we've got a sort of looking at cross, cross sectors, um, getting some organisations to complete it. And yeah, that, I mean, that's my background in terms of sort of that, that developing of these kind of tools so, so yes hopefully will be we're not there yet um but but we're going through the process to make it because we want to be able to do something with the data um you know we'd like to have a data set that can tell us something um so so yes going through that process of, of currently validating it um not not there yet and if anyone's interested in in you know in getting involved um let us know Okay, well, that's the final question, Joanne, and that's took us to just before that passed, so perfect timing. Um, is there anything else you want to add, Elsa? Do you want to add anything before we close? No, that's, that's oh. it for me. <laughs> Apologies yeah. for being quiet today. <laughs> yeah, good. Uh, so thank you both. Um, thank you, Joanne, for your time. I'm sure all the, all the members um, appreciate you very much, and the fact that um, we've got that link there, I think, at the end. I've just clicked on it and I'll certainly download it, as will others. So That's thank you very much indeed. Well. If, if anyone wants to make contact or, or get in touch, there's our contact details. Yeah, brilliant. I'll see you know, Elsa. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. So thank you very much.